work health and safety. This set of slides has been developed to enable you to identify potential hazards that you may encompass as a result of your work as a building biologist or feng shui consultant. In 2018, 12 people were killed on Australian work sites. Around $61.8 billion was spent on work cover related injuries and disease to the Australian uh, population. This is why it's really important during a site inspection that you identify potential hazards that could affect your health in order to reduce the implications of injuries and to enable a long life uh, as an occupation in building biology and feng shui. There are legal ramifications for you working at a home which then becomes a work site for you and these are the regulatory hierarchy. It starts with the Act which is passed in Parliament as a bill and the Act is legally enforceable. And the most relevant Act when it comes to a workplace is the Work Health and Safety Act of 2011. And in short, it provides the recommendations as to why you as an employer must look after yourself and any of your employees at a work site. The regulations provide more specific detail uh, as to how to comply with the Act, the Work Health and Safety Act. Uh, and they include hundreds of different documents from asbestos and lead dust, confined spaces, chemicals, etc, etc, etc. The codes of practice and the industry documents like the Australian standards uh, and guidance notes are not legally enforceable. However, you'll find the codes of practice provided by your local state workplace, um, such as Safe Work Australia, will provide very useful, well illustrated codes of practice for manual handling, how to lift things, ergonomics, uh, chemical um, exposures, etc, etc. And they're really great documents, they're available free on the websites and it's strongly recommended that you have a look at them because they'll help you show you how to create a safe workplace when you're consulting at somebody's home. So what I'd like to do is to show you a risk management process. When you go to a client's house that then becomes a workplace for you and there are three criteria you need to think about when you're on site and we refer to this as a risk management. The first one of those is to identify the hazards that you're likely to be exposed to. The second of those is to assess the risk. What is the likelihood you're going to be exposed to the hazard and develop an injury or a disease as a result of it? The third of those is how to control the risk and this is referred to as the hierarchy of control. So I'm going to go through these three processes and I want you to think about as I go through these when you're going to a house what type of hazards you're likely to be exposed to, what's the risk of, of being exposed to the hazards and being injured or developing a disease and more importantly what you should be thinking in order to reduce your exposure to any of the hazards. So identify the hazard. Conduct a site inspection to identify potential hazards that may exist on site. I've provided an example of a list of hazards you may find in a home. And they include things from asbestos and lead dust, mould in a water damaged building, chemicals, especially if the house is new or has been recently renovated, like from paints, sealants and glues, and to things like being bitten by a dog. So let's go through some of these examples. The assess the risk is to assess the possibility that you may be exposed and develop an injury. In order to assess risk, you have to consider the likelihood of an event occurring. So the likelihood of you being bitten by a dog um, is high, especially if the dog is such that it's more likely to be aggressive, uh, if you go into the backyard, for example. What's the consequence of the event? Well, being bitten, of course. The likelihood, a good example for asbestos. What's the likelihood you're going to be exposed to asbestos at home, knowing that prior to the 1970s, the majority of homes have some degree of asbestos cement sheeting? Well, we know it's there. It's in my home as eaves under my home. However, the consequence, the likelihood that you're going to be exposed to asbestos is almost nil if there's no renovation, if that asbestos is not disturbed, if there's no renovation uh, of any kind, then the likelihood that you're going to be exposed is almost zero. So even though the hazard of asbestos, which can cause asbestosis, 
mesothelioma and lung cancer is great, the consequence of being exposed to asbestos is great, the likelihood that you're going to be exposed is almost nil because there is no disturbance of that asbestos cement sheet uh, and therefore you're unlikely to be exposed. Lead dust would be another example. Lead is incredibly toxic. However, even though the lead content of the paint in a house built before 1965 or painted before 1965 is about 50% lead content, unless that lead dust is disturbed and they're sanding back the walls, uh, then of course the, the likelihood you're going to be exposed is high and the consequence may be um, ingesting that or inhaling that in the body and of course lead is associated with a myriad of side effects which I'll go into shortly. If that lead is not disturbed and it's not a dust, it's just on the wall, then the, the likelihood of you being exposed is very, very minimal. Mould is another good example. The likelihood you're going to be exposed to mould is high in a water damaged building and there's certain ways we can assess whether you need to wear a full face respirator and Tyvek suit, which I'll go into shortly. So assessing the risk is really important. You can have a very severe hazard like asbestos and lead dust, but the likelihood of you being exposed is minimal in most of the homes you're likely to walk into. The last, of course, is to control the risk. You need to understand the hierarchy of control, uh, and that includes what the mnemonic that I refer to as ESEEP, eliminate, substitute, engineer, administer and uh, personal protective equipment. I will go through some examples of how to implement the hierarchy of control for certain hazards at the end of this talk. So let's identify the most common hazards you're likely to be exposed to in a home or the built environment. There are four categories of hazards. They include your biotoxins such as biotoxins in a water damaged building would be the most common. So bacteria, fungi and all their byproducts, endotoxins, mycotoxins, microbial VOCs, uh, tick bites for example, not so common inside a home, uh, however it, it can occur. Um, they are your biological exposures. The next category of hazards are chemicals and of course that is more likely to arise in a new home that's been renovated or renovated uh, as a result of paint sealants and glues uh, or it can happen in a workplace where they specifically use toxic chemicals as part of their manufacturing processes. Pesticides is the other one that is certainly a high category of adverse health effects associated with it. So if you know the client has recently sprayed their home for spiders or termites, etc., you probably want to know that information before you go on site. The next category are physical hazards. And they are things likely to occur if you trip or fall over uh, or fall from a height. In building biology, you will be required at times to climb ladders and, and look in through the manhole into the roof space. Um, and of course, you know, there is a chance, small chance you may fall. So it's really important that you implement an adequate controls to prevent this from happening. Other things include vibration or noise or confined spaces. Again, as a building biologist, you know, if you are in the subfloor, that is a confined space, a roof is also a confined space. Uh, it's not something we encourage you to do, is to walk through roof spaces. However, most of the time you will be required to put your head in the roof space, have a look around, take lots of pictures, use torches to identify uh, hazards in the roof space, level of dust, pest, pest uh, exposures, all of those things. The last one is psychological, and this is unlikely to relate to you. It generally relates to psychosocial stress as a result of um, stress coming from work colleagues at a workplace or from management, um, emotional strain, um, interpersonal problems, etc. So that's not likely to relate to you as a consultant. So let's go through the most common hazards you're likely to um, be exposed to when you're going to a home. And I've mentioned asbestos. It's certainly one of the biggest ones you need to be mindful of. Asbestos was um, 
used in over 3,000 building material products between 1945 and 1980. It was used in water pipes, asbestos cement sheet to cover water pipes, a fibrous cement sheeting in roof tiles, uh, in insulation, vinyl floor coverings, lagging of pipes, in um, brake pads. It was used until 2003 in car brake pads. So it was used for a very long period of time. It was an incredibly remarkable material because it was incredibly durable and heat resistant, which made it an amazing product. But of course it came at a huge cost to human health. Uh, 37 years after exposure, up to four decades after exposure, um, many men and some women developed asbestosis or mesothelioma or lung cancer because it had a very long latency period. In 2010, more people died from asbestos-related exposure from 40 years before than any other period in Australia's history. And people are still dying from it, from being exposed 40 years before. In fact, you know, children who were exposed to asbestos when their parents were renovating their home um, have had case studies where they've developed lung cancers uh, three to four decades later. So if there's any form of renovation and you suspect asbestos is there, it is absolutely critical um, that you get the client to get a licensed asbestos controller in order to identify that asbestos and of course to remove it. You are not legally allowed to identify asbestos cement sheet or any form of asbestos product because it, it falls under a regulation. So it's important if you think it's there that you document that in your report and state that you suspect it may be present and you should, the client should seek a licensed asbestos um, consultant to identify and or remove that asbestos, as I've mentioned here under recommendations. Don't disturb the material, of course that's really important um, to reduce your exposure to that material. As I indicated, many homes will contain asbestos, like my home in the eaves for example, but it's not a problem providing it's not disturbed and it's not crumbling so you can't inhale the fibres. You may, if you suspect there's asbestos on site, um, it's recommended that you don't go on that site. For whatever reason, if you are required as a building biologist to look through the roof cavity and you suspect asbestos cement sheet or insulation fibres could be in the roof space, then as always we recommend you wear a full face respirator um, or a class P2 mask, full face is always better, uh, in order to protect your respiratory passages from inhaling those fibres. Disposable protective clothing may be required, certainly if there's any form of demolition work or renovation that will be disturbing those fibres. The next hazard are chemicals. Now, any home that's less than five years age is going to still be outgassing quite a number of what we call volatile organic compounds or VOCs. And it's often the semi-VOCs from sealants and paints and especially polyurethane floor uh, coverings that can emit VOCs for many, many years. And many of them are lung, eye and skin irritants and some people are going to be more susceptible than others to these chemicals. Now, um, so it's important just asking the age of the house. Uh, in order to reduce your exposure, what we recommend is of course to open up the windows and I'll go through that shortly. shortly. Pesticides is another one that's a big one on my list as you'll notice in my book Healthy Home Healthy Family. Um, between the 1940s to the current time we've been using pesticides. Between 1940s and 1980s we used the organochlorine pesticides. They include your DDT, dieldrin, heptachlor, etc. which are organochlorine pesticides which are known carcinogens or cancer causing chemicals. They cause infertility, birth defects, blah blah blah. Very toxic chemicals. They have now been banned in Australia. However, in the 1980s it was actually required by the councils that houses routinely sprayed their slabs and subfloors with organochlorine pesticides and they are still breaking down to this day in the soils. So knowing the age of the house is really important, especially um, between the 1940s and 1980s because these chemicals are still breaking down in the soil. It's really important therefore if they have chooks or young children that they're not 
playing uh, near the subfloors of these homes because they still these chemicals will still be breaking down. And once they're in their body, they're lipophilic, which means they'll stay in the fat tissues for life, and then they pass through the placenta and the breast milk. That's why all of us have found DDT levels in all of our bodies, even the children that are born to this day, because it's passed through the placenta and the breast milk. It's lipophilic. Uh, pesticides. Now they're using the organophosphates and of course glyphosate, um, showing to be having devastating impacts on the gut microbiome. It's important to note pesticides are all antibacterial and we now know the gut microbes or microbes in our bacteria in our gut play an important role in our immune system, in our overall health and they've been strongly correlated with things like Parkinson's and neurodegenerative disorders and also autism and learning and behavioural disorders. Pesticides is one of those chemicals when I did my literature review for my PhD that came up with almost every chronic disease you can think of, there's a pesticide that has been correlated with it. And as you'll see, as you read through my book, you know, pesticides were found in, you know, farmers are commonly found, um, um, sorry, Parkinson's are commonly found in farmers and they're correlating these with their exposures to these pesticides because they affect the central nervous system. So that's really important. So asking the client about the history of pesticide use, you know, whether they're using pesticides inside for flies and insects, for termites, do they get a professional um, pest controller to come in to get rid of spiders? These are incredibly toxic chemicals. They should never be used inside a home. And you want to know if they've sprayed recently before you go inside that home. So what do we do in order to reduce our exposure to these chemicals? Well, Ideally, as a building biologist, not a feng shui consultant, but certainly as a building biologist, you want to obtain the safety data sheet for that specific chemical in order to identify the potential adverse health effects um, and what to do um, to reduce exposure. Really important, of course, is that it doesn't cover synergistic effects, which we go into detail throughout the building biology course. So safety data sheets give us some preliminary information about adverse health effects, but they are very minimal and they don't look at the synergistic or combined effects of multiple chemicals from our food, our air, our water, and of course, you know, in our homes. Open windows, if they've recently sprayed chemicals, air fresheners, uh, perfume, anything like that, chemical pesticides, then you know, get the client to open up the windows. Of course, if you're doing a mold audit as a building biologist, that's not recommended because you want to make you want to create an environment that is going to reflect worst case scenario. So we'll train you that when we do mould testing and air sampling. Wear a face mask if you are exposed. Now, look, a lot people who are chemically sensitive really important that they content, that they consider wearing a face mask that has a filter specifically manufactured for that type of chemical. As you can see here, here is a face mask and has a, a carbon filters built within it. The next hazard we need to be mindful of is dust. And dust is more likely to happen in uh, where there's construction sites, obviously in new homes. So building biologists who are providing advice to builders, architects, etc., who are going on site, um, that can be an issue that you need to be mindful of, or of course during any form of renovating. The biggest concern associated with dust is exposure to lead. Now, between prior to the 1970s, the content of lead in paint was 50%. In 1965, that was changed to 1%, and by in the 1990s, changed to 0.1%. So lead-free paint nowadays could actually still contain a very small percentage of lead. Now, lead is incredibly toxic. It is it is causes learning and behavioural disorders. It will cause a drop in intelligence or IQ in children. So it's really important that uh, you don't expose yourself to lead dust. And of course the clients, really important that they don't either. For all the building biologists, I strongly suggest you do lead testing for any house built prior to the 1970s. You are likely to find lead dust in the roof space and often in the subfloor. Now if they are storing their um, furnishings or mattresses or suitcases in roof spaces and the house was built before 1970, that is a problem because lead dust is likely to be present and it should be tested. We will go through that in detail in the air sampling subject. So lead was also used in water pipes. 
Uh, in fact, the demise of the Roman Empire was thought to be due to the use of lead pipe, which of course can cause infertility and mental illness, mental dullness and depression, uh, male infertility. Uh, of course, it's also related to the, uh, learning behavioural disorders in children, etc. Uh, lead solder was used on steel water pipes until 1989. So lead solder was co commonly used on galvanised steel pipes. And of course, the chlorine in the drinking water accelerates the corrosion and exposure to lead. And of course, lead in drinking water is much higher if you allow the water to sit in the pipe for more than 24 hours or even over 12 hours, which is why any form of galve pipe in a home built between, before 1990 um, should be flushed for a minute or two before you drink from it, or more importantly, get a water filter. We will discuss this at length in the water pollution subject. So the recommendations for dust is to open windows to dilute the dust as much as possible. Um, really important that we actually use a vacuum cleaner fitted with a HEPA filter, high efficiency particulate air filter, um, because that will actually trap anything below point, up to, uh, below, and below 0.3 microns. All your largest dust particles generally are going to be trapped by a HEPA filter, so that's really important for the um, for you to consider. Of course a dust mask can be useful. We always recommend in building biology we use a full face mask to protect not just your nose and inhalation but also your eyes as eyes are a common way in which biotoxins can get through. Disposable protective clothing can also be very useful um, but only in cases where there's high levels of dust say during renovations or construction. It's not often I'll wear protective clothing except in a significantly water damaged building. Remove clothing before you go into your home. So ideally, I mean, disposable clothes should be used, Tyvek suits, uh, in water damaged buildings and certainly in homes where there could be exposed to lead dust, which of course you would remove and put in a garbage bag at the client's house. If you are exposed to dust and you don't wear a Tyvek suit, then you know take your clothes off in the laundry before you go into the rest of the house and uh, launder it on its own, not with other clothes. Refer the client to ADRA, really important. If the house is built before um, this time when lead was used prior to the 1970s, the Australian Dust Removalist Association Incorporation have specific protocols on how to remove uh, dust, lead dust from homes. So if a client is thinking about renovating and their house was built before this time, especially if they're pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant or have young children, it's critical that the people move out and they get a professional like ADRA uh, in order to be able to properly get rid of that lead dust because it's incredibly toxic and once it's in the body of a child, it's almost impossible to get rid of and it will affect their learning and behaviour. The next hazard is electrocution. A lot of this is really common sense, but you know, let's go through it anyway. Of course, uh, electrocution can occur in any home that has been wired, and of course, the older the house is, the more likely the electrical wiring could be old and frayed or damaged, etc. So any faulty or exposed or cracked wires or wire plugs in appliances you should not touch. Placing metal devices in appliances or power points should be avoided. And of course, using appliances near water should always be avoided. And here are some pictures um, that you would definitely warn the client not to have this scenario. You know, multiple plugs on a single outlet, strongly recommended not to have that. Um, very important to prevent the risk of hazard and fire. Recommendations for electrocution, don't touch faulty appliances obviously, don't play with power boards, um, refer the client to a licensed electrician to get their wires what we refer to as tested and tagged. That is something that is a requirement in a workplace, not in a home but it's a good thing when the electrician next comes to the house that they should look at the appliances. Don't fiddle with the switchboard or smart meter or meter panel, really important. We're not electricians. As building biologists, we don't train you to become an electrician, so you shouldn't be fiddling with the panel at all. Encourage the client to install uh, power plugs into the power points if they have young children in order to prevent electrocution. And don't use electrical appliances near water, obviously. Falls, 
In building biology, you will be required at times to use ladders in order to have a look at gutters, um, to look into the roof space, etc. So it's important you have a good ladder that has a strong footing that complies with Australian standards. I always recommend when you're using a ladder that the client is there with you to stabilise it and to check in the case you fall, they're there straight away so they can ring an emergency. Um, really important that the ladder you bring, you should bring your own, is safe and sturdy. Um, tripping over during the site visit, you know, be mindful as you're walking. Have comfortable shoes. High heels is really not appropriate in building biology, even in feng shui consulting. You know, sometimes when you go to do an order, it can be muddy, the weather can be awful. You want really comfortable shoes um, that have good traction. And use your eyes to look for potential clutter, trip hazards, etc., and, and be mindful of that during a site visit. Uh, with building biology, you will be required to use quite a bit of equipment. Some of this equipment is heavy. So, you know, pack your bags in a way that you don't have to lift like 20 kilos at a time because, of course, you'll do your back that way and cause musculoskeletal injuries. Use your common sense. Ideally, pack your bags up to five kilos um, that are easy to lift and then, you know, or suitcases on rollers so that you don't have to lift heavy things. So wear appropriate shoes. Conduct a site inspection for potential trip hazards. As you're walking around the site and the client's showing you their home inside and out, that's when you're mindful of potential hazards. As I mentioned, use a ladder with a suitable safety rating. Inform the client what you're doing, especially if you're going on ladders and heights, that's always important. And pack your gear so it doesn't, it's not too heavy and it doesn't cause musculoskeletal problems. Don't climb on the roof. Under no circumstances ever should you climb on the roof as building biologists. What I strongly suggest you do, if it's possible, is to get to high ground, uh, even if that means you have to go onto a neighbouring property, get their permission to see if you can get onto their property so you can look down onto the, your client's roof. I have binoculars, they are, I find them very useful, so I can have a look closely at the flashing around a roof to see that it's um, uh, properly done, it's not rusting, there's no entry for which water can get through. I can have a look at the state of the gutters and the leaf litter, etc. So binoculars are good and just getting to high ground can be more useful and of course without the danger of getting onto anyone's roof, which we strongly recommend you don't do. The next issue is water damaged buildings and this is something that the building biologists are going, potentially if you're specialising in this, that you're going to be walking into quite a lot. Uh, the degree of water damaged buildings is at least one in two in Australia. Um, most of the time it's, well, a lot of the time it's not going to be an issue unless someone, of course, has the genes that make them susceptible to it. Although, in a lot of homes, people without the genes susceptible to mould can still have asthma and allergies and skin problems and sinus and hay fever as a result of exposure to uh, the biotoxins in a water damaged building. So exposure to biotoxins in a water damaged building may result in all of those symptoms I've just mentioned, diseases, an increased exposure to allergens like house dust mite. You're going to get pests attracted to a water damaged building. Even termites will be attracted to a water damaged building. And as a building biologist, I always say that to the clients, that if there's water damage here, especially in the subfloor, you know, you might need to get a pest controller to check for termites because they frequently come uh, wherever there's water damage. And of course, pests like cockroaches and house dust mite and rodents are attracted to water damaged buildings. So it's important that if the client has allergies to these, that, that this is addressed as well. So the recommendations in a water damaged building is to assess the risk. And the way to establish that as a building biologist, so I'm talking building biology here, is to identify the client's symptoms, which you'll go through in the questionnaire. If the symptoms reflect SIRS, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, then you know you're going to be mindful that this could be an issue in this home. You're going to look at the history of moisture intrusion. Are you going to ask the clients about the history of flooding, any spills, any water damage that they're aware of? And the more water damage there is, of course, the higher the risk that there's going to be biotoxins in that, in that home. You're going to ide identify the presence of odour during your site inspection, but also the client may be mindful or aware of odours damp, musty odours that could reflect uh, water damaged building and biotoxins. Odours generally reflect uh, exposure to volatile organic compounds uh, when the fungi are actually reproducing. And of course the extent of the visible mould. If the client says there's you know, a visible mould in these rooms, then you know, you know that there's going to be significant water damage. <laughs>
Wear a full face mask. If you're doing a building biology audit, it's really important that you wear a full face mask, not just around the nose and the mouth, because many of the biotoxins can come through the eyes. And we'll talk about that and show you how to put it on in the mould testing subject. Protective clothing may need to be worn, um, especially in significant water damage buildings. Uh, um, and these are things that you, we will discuss in the mould testing course. Now I want to focus on the last section of this video is the hierarchy of control. This is something you should ingrain and embed in your, in your mind because every time you come across a hazard as a building biologist or feng shui consultant, this should be at the forefront of your mind. In order to address any hazard you come across, the first thing you should ask yourself is how can I eliminate that hazard? And this is a really important part of the recommendations you make in your report, especially as a building biologist. So here's a hazard. So let's do use electromagnetic fields as the example. All right, so we have a high, say, AC magnetic field as a result of the client sleeping on the other side of the wall of the meter panel or smart meter. Can we eliminate the smart meter? Well, no, we can't. But we can relocate it to a different part of the house. But that's going to cost about $10,000 or so. So can we substitute it for something else? Well, no, we can't. It's a smart meter. You can only have only one meter panel in the home. So because we can't eliminate it and we can't substitute it, can we engineer it? I.e., can we create something like um, shielding paints or shielding wallpaper? Yes, we can do shielding paints and wallpaper, which is considered to be a form of engineering, on the wall where the smart meter is to attenuate or reduce the exposure to radio frequencies. Whilst that will reduce the RF component of the smart meter, it will not address the magnetic field from the smart meter, which you can't use any form of shielding. So we can engineer and that will reduce the RF. The next thing is administer in the hierarchy of control. And the administer really focuses on housekeeping and educating the client. So what I'd say to the client is to reduce their exposure to the smart meter, do use some shielding paint and get an electrician involved. And secondly, relocate the bed to another room or if that is not possible, at least to the opposite wall to the smart meter to reduce your exposure to the AC magnetic field. So the two things we recommended was shielding paint to reduce the exposure to radio frequency or the wireless component to the smart meter. And secondly, administer, educate the client to reduce their exposure by creating distance from the source. So examples of how to reduce exposure to electromagnetic fields are to things like, do we really need all those appliances in the bedroom? Do we need the digital clock radio, cordless phone, you know, electric blanket, TV, um, digital devices? No, the bedroom is the most important part of the entire room because you spend 22 years of your life in the bedroom and any form of electrical device is going to affect melatonin levels which of course affects sleep and affects your body circadian rhythm and affects your hormones and of course can affect immune function. Substitute. Well we can replace the digital clock radio for a battery operator or wind-up clock so that's a good example of substitution. Or we can substitute the cordless phone for a hardwired landline phone. So that's an example of substitution for electromagnetic fields. The next one is engineer. Now engineering generally implies a, an expert is required to make something in order to help reduce your exposure to that hazard. And that would be things like shielding paints, shielding wallpapers, uh, etc. shielded clothing. Shielding is generally used as a very last resort with electromagnetic field exposure because it doesn't get rid of the source and it doesn't effectively get rid of the entire uh, radio frequencies or AC magnetic fields. Um, so that's why it's considered to be a last resort, but it can be useful in some cases. Administer is considered to be one of the most important of all the hierarchy of control for electromagnetic fields because the most effective way to reduce your exposure is distance. So you're educating the client why they need to get rid of those appliances out of the room, especially bedrooms, and why they need to relocate their beds or favourite sofas away from the field. So you are educating them why they shouldn't be using digital devices for too long a period of time. Um, and more importantly, why they should never use a digital device, iPads, laptops, computers, uh, etc. Um, an hour before bed because of course the blue light can affect melatonin levels significantly and affect your ability to sleep, circadian rhythm, etc. The last of those is PPE, personal protective equipment. 
for you, if you're electrically sensitive, then as a building biologist, you may not want to focus on, on this area because of course you don't want to be exposed to yourself all the time. But there are forms of shielded clothing that you can use. There are problems associated with shielded clothing, which we will discuss at length in the electrobiology subject. The next example I want to give are uh, using the hierarchy of control for allergens like dust mite and pollens and pet dander and pests. Can we eliminate the pest? Well, yes, we would educate the client, this is administer, by telling them to get rid of food. Don't leave food lying around the home, around the kitchen, clean up after every meal. Don't leave pet food lying around even outside of the home. If the if the pet hasn't eaten the food within 15 minutes, then cover it up or put it away to prevent rodents and other animals from being attracted to the property. Clutter is also a really important thing. If you provide shelter, then of course the spiders and rats and rodents will come. So it's important to reduce their shelter. And of course, moisture and water. Not having water left around the home, uh, that will attract pests in the first place. Substitute, chemical cleaning products for microfiber cloths. Many chemicals are associated with allergies, living within 200 metres of traffic related air pollutants and high traffic flow roads can significantly increase your risk for asthma and allergies. So this is where not having the garage attached to the house, not idling the car in the garage where it can come, the fumes can get into the house is really important. Having an air filter in the room where the, child, where the person has allergies can also be useful. Uh, having both a HEPA and uh, carbon filter in the air filter can make quite a bit of a difference for people with allergies. Administer. Use dust mite resistant covers. We'll cover this in, at length in the uh, children's environmental health subject. However, it is also covered in my book, Healthy Home, Healthy Family. Use an air filter, as I mentioned, that will come under engineering. Administer. One of the most important of the hierarchy of control is educate the client. Good housekeeping, making sure they use a vacuum cleaner fitted with a HEPA filter and a motorised head. Make sure they vacuum for at least a minute per square metre of carpet, especially in rooms uh, where people suffer from allergies is important. Not having pets sleeping on beds, not allowing pets to furry pets to go in carpeted areas of the house or maybe not even in the house altogether. Um, lots of tips in my book on this. And of course there is no personal protective equipment really for allergens that is useful. Some dust masks can be useful but you know people can't live with a dust mask if they've got allergies in the home. So that goes through why it's important to identify potential hazards because you'll be walking on people's, at people's homes all the time. You'll get used to looking for these potential hazards uh, during the site inspection and it's important to be mindful of that to reduce your exposure because we want you to have a very long and prosperous career as a building biologist and feng shui consultant um, because that'll be great for the college the more consultants we have out there.